So Joshi Ia said, if you've ever encountered a too fat to bulk, too skinny to cut situation, what did you do? Uh, Whoa, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so like I think in my recent podcast with uh, Dr. Um, Alan Bacon, we were talking about how that, that's that's really the hardest thing to deal with, right? And, and that is often what you get because, I mean, everybody wants to be bigger and leaner, but there are some people where it's like, this is a clear situation. This is why, you know, I, I've said this to Steve Hall before, but it's like, if you look at Steve Hall's early pictures and you tell me that this guy has crappy genetics, I think you're nuts to see somebody who's that lean that they literally have pec striations before they've ever picked up a weight is crazy. There are plenty of people who would just, and you could say, oh, well, he was running. Okay. Plenty of people are runners and are just skinny fat. They have no like, you know, muscle tone. They have no definition at all. So if you're that lean, like show me anybody who's like 15, 16, 17, and just really lean, I don't care how skinny they are. I can pretty much guarantee they're going to look fantastic within a few years of lifting they're going to look much more impressive it's somebody who just looks like they just eat eaten like doritos their whole life and it's just a skinny fat blob <laughs> that is a lot harder to deal with yeah yeah it's i i think it's worth it to address this question because um my perspective changed on this over the years um, and, and I think, so on my website, there's this free downloadable ebook thingy that I put up and that's, that's about this. So, uh, like, should I cut or bulk basically is the title. And in that one, I basically made the argument that, well, listen, I mean, you're probably both fatter and less muscular than what your kind of ideal physique is. Mm -hmm. So how about you do what you can do faster for now, and then worry about the thing that's going to take a lot more time anyway. So yeah, just cut down first then at least like you're going to get closer to the, the the leanness part of that ideal image that you have. And then after that, you can work on the muscle. Um, it, it makes sense. But at the same time, like, like there are some cases where someone is like, it's truly too skinny to cut. And, and at the same time, it's just too, too soft to bulk. So um, I, I think that is just a more nuanced thing. And probably it's worth asking some questions of the person. So like, let's say I see like a prototypical kind of skinny fat person. Um, if that person was traditionally kind of like a, a, a fat kid and actually they dieted down to this spot. So this is actually a huge accomplishment that they mm -hmm. got this lean and now they or might be like kind of like crazy hungry all the time or whatever. It's probably like cutting even further is not the best solution. If this is kind of just their like hang around weight and and body body composition and this is what they do by just sitting on the couch and eating chips all the time then yeah like like probably like a bit of a deficit phase like higher protein whatever they are going to be so satiated on that diet compared to the shitty one that they had so far that yeah like cutting could be a totally valid option um also like age right like if it's a really young dude like then i'm always a little bit reluctant to make them cut unless they are like very obviously over fat but that's not what we are talking about um and so also like how how beginner is the person so if it's like a relatively new person to lifting or completely new then i think actually trying to achieve some like recomping like addressing that more purposefully by putting them into like a small deficit and just make them train hard like they, they could really go through that magical phase of like, yeah, my, my body is just getting bigger and leaner seemingly. So in that case, that's a totally valid option um, to put a person like that. So that's where it comes down to like, okay, is it more of a skinny person or is it more of a fat person? Because oftentimes like you can pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is that, but like, if it's truly like that kind of in between, like no man's land, then then I think it comes down to these like personalized questions of, about the person. And from that, you can kind of make a better judgment call. I don't know. Probably that was a bit too vague, but, but no, very I wise. Think, <laughs> I think it has to be vague because it, it really does depend on the person's history. Like you said, are they dieted down to the skinny fat or are they just naturally that skinny fat? Um, their age, as you mentioned, you know, I'm very reluctant to have somebody who's even below 18 do too much dieting. Um, you know, do they have some base level of strength where, you know, there's actually muscle underneath there, but they just kind of look skinny fat. There's so much that goes into it. I like what you said about, you know, it's a lot easier to get to the lean aspect of it first. So that makes sense. 
Um, but I also think it's a period of time that if you are a ranked beginner, you can, because you can be skinny fat and not be a total beginner, you know, but if you're a ranked beginner, you could use that time to recomp. Like that's one of the few times that I do think it makes sense to kind of recomp. So, um, it is vague, but it's, it's necessarily vague. So B D D D D D D 74 asks lower body grows much faster than upper. Is this common? I would say, consider yourself blessed. <laughs> Uh, I, it, it's so, I actually feel like it is kind of common. Um, it, and then probably like someone, actually someone like you with like long legs might, might jump in and say like, no, no, actually I have to work really hard to grow my legs. But I, I feel like this is, this is something I commonly hear that my lower body grows easily, but of course it might be just a, a psychological thing that actually it doesn't grow any faster than the upper body. It's just, you care about it less. So it sure. grows fast enough for your liking whereas your upper body doesn't um but it but but it is kind of something that i i tend to see that like you look at someone who looks kind of on not, not untrained but like not not like someone who got close to their genetic potential but has like very respectable like quad size and like you look at their legs and it's like okay this person definitely trains so i feel like this is somewhat common and 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 also like like a guy will pretty frequently in my experience get to that point where like I uh, need to buy new jeans and whatever. Like it kind of looks funny because my ass is protruding so much in these pants. I need new ones. Whereas like upper body is just, I mean, it's just hard to grow. Um, so I don't know. What is your experience? I actually do think it's as common as somebody who has a disproportionately uh, large upper body. I think it's at least like genetically speaking, I think you don't see it as often because people don't tr tend to train lower body sometimes at all. Um, sometimes just not nearly as hard with as much emphasis as the upper body. But I think if somebody, you just took, you know, a hundred people and you had them train their upper body and lower body, you know, let's say quote unquote, ideally, I think you'd have plenty of people, maybe half, maybe close where their upper body is larger. And then same thing with uh, lower body. I can think of a couple like a uh, Milo Wolf is an example where like really dominant lower body, you know, good upper body, but really dominant uh, revive stronger just posted somebody, one of their clients that he's like about to compete, I think. And his lower body is pretty impressive and his upper body. It, I mean, it looks like somebody who's been training for 10 years on their lower body and like two years on their upper body. I mean, it's a huge difference. As even um, Pascal floor is another example where yeah. his lower body is much more impressive than his upper body. So you, you see that plenty of times. Um, and also, you know, again, we, we talk about my proportions and whatnot, but my, my thighs are not skinny. Like I've had, even right now, I just measured them the other day at the largest area, they are about 26 and a half inches. And in the middle, they're like 24, 24 and a half. I mean, those aren't small thighs for a guy who's like, you know, 195 or so. I mean, they're not huge, but most of it is the shape. I, I know one guy who thinks his quads are amazing and then they're, they're shaped well, I guess, but they're probably like 21, 22 inch quads. It's just, um, and I think even your, your quads and your legs in general, Abel are, are pretty solid, but the measurements aren't huge. So uh, again, yeah. it goes a lot back to limb length and, and all that stuff. 50, 56 centimeters, by the way, just, uh, measured them now. Did you see that? What is that? I, always, I literally just have to have a calculator when I talk to you because, <laughs> oh, so, uh, 22 that's in the center. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I tried to measure it at the fattest part. Oh, that's at the fattest part. So is it my, mine is just fat, like larger and larger, the more I go up. So if I measure it, like kind of right at like the glute ham tie in, that's where I get like 26 and a half or so. But I tried, it's very hard with like, like, unlike arms where I can consistently get the exact same spot for measurements with legs, it's tough because you move it a little bit. So I try to just do, I'll put my arms to my side and I'll just see kind of where my fingers naturally like fall to, which is kind of right around the middle. And that's where I measure. Yeah, it's actually, okay, I'll, I'll do this again now. Cause, cause like, I'm actually curious, like how much will I grow back once I start training quads again? Oh yeah. Um, you're waiting now. Yeah. Gotta be a lot bigger now. Yeah. Okay. Now it's 58. Okay. And that's but, in the middle. Yeah. So it's, well, I'll show you where <laughs> it's. Wow. It's okay. Here. See, so yeah. that's not even 23 inches then, which is crazy because you look like you have, I mean, not again, not that that's small, but you look like you have these meaty legs and like, that's a pretty, 
I think that's because they're short. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have particularly short legs. Sure so. wish I could be five five, man. <laughs> what a dream it would be. <laughs> just just for the ladies, I'm not five five. Just kidding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you seen Jason Genova's upper body, lower body thing? No. <laughs> I uh, I I won't I won't uh bother people with a minute and a half, but so this is this is the video on here. I'll I'll link it down below, but it's just this has stood out to me anytime I hear somebody talk about this topic and he just goes on this ramble about it's like the upper body, you know, the lower body, if the lower body is strong, you, you know, if the lower body's weak, you got a problem. If the upper body and he just goes on this ridiculous ramble for a minute and a half and the <laughs> guy who's interviewing him or whatever is like, Jesus, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but he, uh, but he's still active. Um, This is like 10 years ago. I don't know if uh, oh, okay. I don't know if he's still active anymore. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, I'm just going to go real quick with this one. Out of the 18 plus years of experience, what training variables works best for you? It's a pretty, it's that's that could be a, a book. <laughs> so I would just say my emphasis on progressive overload and both with diet and training has been definitely responsible for the majority of the results, which obviously you can get into, well, how do you progressively overload what leads to that? But I'm just going to leave that there and just say progressing over time with increased calories, progressing over time with getting stronger in moderate rep ranges. That's like the vast majority of it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I would say same. And then on top of that, I would just say like, I always um, like relatively lower volume or moderate volume and yeah, so relatively consistent. So I talked about how you can be flexible, but relatively consistent schedule and yeah, moderate moderate volumes, strong focus on progressive overload. And yeah, anytime I went considerably higher in volumes, I'm not saying it didn't help, but it was, I, I couldn't tell if it helped, mm -hmm. but it always made it harder to to overload and to focus on that progressive overload, like always like more likely to get niggled up and whatever. So easily overviewable, moderate volume, strong focus on the progression. And it, whenever I got stronger, uh, considerably, those were the times when I could look at an area and say like, okay, like I think I have made progress muscle wise mm -hmm. as well. I like this one. Uh, Jasper Giddy, when were you enjoying training the most? Huh. That's a so, good question. Yeah. Um, I would say looking back, probably uh, college and dental school. And again, it's one of those things where you always, well, like one, there's the rosy retrospection and two, it's never as enjoyable at the time because you're like, I got to get these results now. I got to get these results now. So unfortunately, it wasn't until these last few years where I haven't made progress <laughs> that or at least not mm -hmm. significant progress where I've been able to actually just step back and enjoy it more just for the training itself. However, I think if I could have gone back with my current mindset, that would have been the best period. And I, and I did really enjoy it um, for a number of reasons. Number one, I was clearly making the best progress. Like you'd think, oh, you started in high school. That's when the best progress was. And it's like, honestly, my first year, I made a lot of progress. And then uh, my junior and senior year, I just, there was like other like stuff going on and I just didn't progress that much. But in college, I gained eight pounds net my first year, seven, no, sorry, seven pounds, then eight pounds my sophomore year, uh, then probably like five and then maybe like three. And then dental school, I got kind of another boost. And um, so that was awesome to see that progress and to like really visually see that I was getting way more attention from people because of that. And so that was nice. Obviously, like at the time, you know, you're like 20, 21, like all these women complimenting you. That was really nice. Um, and then I would say also just socially, like when I was in high school, I kind of just worked out alone in my basement. And then when I went to college and dental school, it became very social. And it's not like, oh, I'm just talking at the gym all the time. But that's literally my closest friends to this date are... Um, my closest friends to this day are the people I met at the gym, both in college and dental school, like some of my mm -hmm. very close friends. And I, you know, you had that initial bonding experience. And then even if they don't lift as much now, you still had that initial thing to kind of create that friendship. So I really enjoyed the environment, which is actually one of the several reasons I don't like the gym as much anymore, because at the time, 
we were all kind of doing the same thing. We're on the same path. And now when I go to the gym, it's just like a lot of people who, I don't know, it's just a very different environment, just being like a gen pop gym, but a university gym for those four to eight years was really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, just that, that reminded me that I, I fucking, I really need to complete this home gym building project because more and more about the NH set, NH has a video that has the title, uh, build a home gym. And then like a subtitle is escape the Gestapo. I don't know. Is that how you say the thing? Mm. Gestapo. And <laughs> so anyway, but, but the, yeah, like I, I'm just so fed up of like just the people in the gym. God damn it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, I've had a couple of phases that I really enjoyed. I, I had, when I was like 22, 23, I was in New Zealand and, and there similarly to you, like I had this little crew that I was regularly co- going to the gym with. And I also had this phase where I was just making really good progress. And, um, I was only training like three days a week. So, cause I was following like Martin Burkhan and these gay, these guys. So that was, I was always super enthusiastic and I was always really looking forward to going to the gym. That was not, that was great. And then in 2019, when I did that crazy high volume experiment, um, that, that was one of those phases where I was just crazy excited about what I can do still. So like, okay, maybe this crazy high volume, that's going to do something magical. So that was exciting. And I, I had a couple of like random ones, like like shorter ones. Like um, I remember when in 2017, like winter, it was, um, yeah, I was doing like four, sometimes five days a week, like moderate volume. And I was just, um, I got a little bit overzealous about certain things that were really working well for me. I kind of, found, I kind of thought that I found the, the magic bullet for training because I like that was one of those like come to Jesus moments where I really moderated the amount of volume I was doing, stopped a bunch of the fluff and really like just, just focused on kind of the the basics and progression and things were working so well that uh, like you can go back and listen to some of those videos and podcasts I recorded at the time. It's all, it almost seems like a person who just did some like LSD or something recently. <laughs> Cause I just seemed like so enlightened that like, man, like, like this is really, really so amazing. So I got a bit overzealous, but it was really enjoyable. And other than that, it's just like, I just remember these random like weeks where it was just so cool. Um, maybe I was like looking forward to like going on a vacation or something. And I was like doing a little bit of a mini cut or something. And like the training before that was so, in, so cool. Cause I went there and I felt like I was on a mission towards something. Yeah. Uh, but these are just like short random ones. So. Yeah, Sometimes. on the short random ones, I would say I've said this several times before, but cruises, I love like when I go on vacation and find a gym there. Um, but cruises, there's like nothing more enjoyable to me than I get up early um, with like my brother or a friend or something. And we go get a workout in because there's not there's no pressure on the workout. Like you're just lifting for fun. I think uh, Bigger Steve recently was saying it's like an amusement park. And that probably sounds so weird to certain people who are not into the the fitness lifestyle, but that's just what I, I like to do. And then when I go and then after that, we'll get like a buffet meal, whatever. That's always great. Um, there was one other thing that you said that I was going to mention on that. Um, Mission for something? Uh, no, just with the uh, with the gym. So actually, one of the questions is the home gym. So that, that's actually a really good tie-in. Uh, Dave can answer this question on video. If you had space, what would you buy for your home gym if you only cared about hypertrophy? I'm wanting to build a home gym. So another interesting question, because I am trying to set up a better home gym for the reasons Abel and I mentioned, um, just the the gym environment is becoming less and less enjoyable to me. So uh, right now I have, so when COVID happened, when I was actually in high school, I was very fortunate. I got for a hundred pounds on Craigslist, or sorry, for a hundred dollars on Craigslist, I got over 300 pounds of weights, a squat rack, a barbell, adjustable dumbbells. It was ridiculous. Uh, now, you know, these weren't like Olympic level things, but who cares? I mean, I was in high school. I didn't need that. And actually it's still there to this day. Um, the bar bent when I did deadlifts. So that wasn't great, (laughs) but but other than that, it was, it was fantastic. And I had a lot of good workouts there. So when COVID happened, I bought adjustable dumbbells on, uh, on Amazon, like just the kind that you can add the weights to. So I can do, I can probably load up to about 120 on them. If I wanted to, I've got a couple hundred pounds of weights here. I have a squat rack kind of, but it's, 
I need a barbell for it. So the setup is I'm kind of limited. And when I get a bigger house, that is like a, a requirement. It's a basement that I can have a finished basement with basically whatever gym equipment I want in there. Um, and if space was not an issue, oh, I that's, that's a that's big, a big thing. if. <laughs> right. That's a that's a big if. Uh, because I mean it can easily take up an entire basement. So I've, I've wondered, should I just do it in a garage? Maybe I I, I gotta figure that out. But I would say you can do it pretty reasonably cost wise with just the basics that I mentioned, like adjustable dumbbells, barbell, a bench, an adjustable bench, right? Incline, decline, flat, all that. Um, and then I think what you and Brian have is great. That whole cable setup. I need to actually get the link from you guys for what, because you guys have the same one, right? No, no, I, I think I'm actually not sure what he has, but uh, it's definitely not the same as mine. Okay. Uh, he has a better one because it has like a, so the pulley on the two sides mm -hmm. and then has like a middle one as well. So uh, so I, I would get that if, if if I could have. But I made a really good deal on mine. It was like 1,500 euros or something like that, which is pretty good for something like this. Yeah. Um, so I would definitely get something like that. And then a few machines. Like I, I actually do quite a lot of my upper body workouts here now, but I pretty much have to go to the gym for lower body. Like the leg extension and leg curl on this bench is just not it's it's better than some i've seen but it's really not adequate um i think a leg extension a leg curl would be a must if you really want the isolations there i would probably try to get a leg press but it seems like what brian and jeff alberts has it's almost like a modified hack squat i think that's pretty reasonable yeah. in cost i've seen those for under a thousand dollars whereas i think like a solid 45 degree leg press is probably several thousand dollars Mm -hmm. Um, I would love hammer strength machines, but you start getting to the point where is it feasible to have, you know, like a whole, I mean, some of these are three, four or $5,000 for one piece of equipment. So, you know, I'm probably yeah. fine with putting, I don't know, 10 to $20,000 into like a nice home gym, but I'm not going to put $50,000 into it, you know? So, um, yeah. you know, what equipment. And then again, like just from a space standpoint, it becomes <laughs> ridiculous if I, if I have an entire basement full of gym, I mean, yeah, it's just gym equipment is, is too, uh, too cumbersome. So that's why I think the pulley system you guys have is great. And then the dumbbells and barbells, you have a lot of utility for minimal room. Yeah. I mean, I think for 10 to $20,000, um, like, like one of these all in one combo racks, um, and, and like one of the fancier ones of, of uh, like out of those could actually be like a very good, uh, investment because like, even though the question says if space was not an issue, but I mean, I mean, so out of all things, maybe it would have been almost better if you said if finances are not an issue because space right. is an issue space for is everyone, issue. Yeah, whereas yeah. finances might not be an issue for everyone. Right. Um, so, but yeah, like, like some of these combo racks are so good. Um, so like it might be like a really good pulley system um i think it's even better if it's plate loaded actually because then you're not limited by the the stack um mm -hmm. increments yeah. or weight total weight uh and then it will come with like a squat rack and a smith machine sometimes even like a leg press attachment so i mean holy shit like that's that's an entire gym basically yeah um but but yeah like honestly right now um and that's Partly just, I would I would either get a squat rack, a good one, on top of this because I already have barbell and weights, or maybe I would actually get a, a good Smith machine um, because, like, honestly, a Smith machine, like you can do so many things and you can even do some things that you can't really do in a squat rack. So, so maybe that would actually be my next addition uh, besides this because um, yeah, like Smith machine squats, like these days I've been doing these Smith machine good mornings, which. I found a setup which actually is mm. it, it's really comfortable with that. You can do like some weird things, which Smith machine might be the best option for those is hip thrusts. So you can even do like deficit hip thrusts in a Smith machine, um, deficit Bulgarian split squats, which was really nice in a Smith machine. So, and then of course like bench presses and whatever. So yeah, I, I think that would be an amazing next edition, but yeah, like, uh, it's actually crazy like a lot of the times i just didn't go to the gym these days because especially because i was freaking sick the whole winter like actually this is my first week where i'm kind of not sick and i was just like going there in the cold and like going to the dressing room and like a bunch of people like close proximity like 
infecting you with your, their their germs and like and then you sweat in that like it's too hot to not sweat but too cold to be sweaty yeah. so i just like hate the whole thing um and I, I train at home a lot of the times and it's it's kind of amazing like the entire lower body or upper body you can train so well with just a, a functional trainer like this because like you can do all the presses you can you can do all the pulls um if the weight stack is not heavy enough uh, even then like so you have two pulleys if you can connect them with like a long bar of sorts and then hook like a single handle on top of that like you like you you can do really heavy like one arm pulls and stuff so yeah it's it's, it's actually like, i'm kind of amazed how good of an investment that was and then on top of that what i already mentioned and oh and make sure that your functional trainer if you buy one comes with a pull-up bar if you don't already mm -hmm. have one because that can be an issue um so yeah that's a good point yeah i used to put a barbell over my squat rack in high school and then do pull-ups on there which was actually fine my brother yeah. i would like it so bad at him for doing this because he would he would do it from the pipes in our basement oh god and i was like dude what are you doing like this i'm, I'm amazed that they didn't break i mean sometimes like not even like the thick ones like the thin like maybe one inch diameter i was just like what is happening here um yeah. Honestly, the more we talk about it, the when more... my father he held my face off for doing that <laughs> once, <laughs> so never since then. The more we talk about, it, the more I'm like, man, I, I I've been tempted several times to just be like, okay, I'm just gonna buy it now. But just knowing how much of a pain it would be to move these things, I don't even know honestly if it would come assemble. I don't even know how it would work. So like a whole trainer like, like you have, I just couldn't do it here because we have to move. So I, I will just unfortunately have to just keep biding my time until we. We actually move. Yeah, usually, usually, if you order it from, I mean, if you buy it secondhand, then it's different, obviously. But like, usually, if you buy it from an actual store of any kind, like there is an option so that the person assembles it for you, or they come and assemble it for you. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, it's probably like two more. Hey, Dave, I've been following your podcast and videos for a while. I'm sorry you slide into your DMs like this. Uh, I live for pure hypertrophy results, so I'm experimenting with different particular lifting styles. I was attracted to the Renaissance periodization and revived stronger lifting style because it seems that it's purely focused on hypertrophy, but it had poor results in some exercises. So I was curious about your opinion. What is the best lifting style for hypertrophy, RP1 or 3DMJ? <laughs> sorry if there are mistakes. Uh -huh. English is not my native language. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave the name out since they were kind of calling out RP and Revive Stronger a little bit there. So I I do think it's interesting. And I, I wonder if it's the complexity of the systems because, and, and again, like this isn't meant to be like a hate or anything because I obviously like these guys a lot. But I, I by far get more DMs about people being like, hey, I've had issues with Renaissance periodization. It didn't work for me. Uh, sometimes Revive Stronger it didn't work for me. Like, you know, either... They want to do coaching or they have questions like this. And I I believe that both of those systems are good and, and can be great for people. So I just wonder, is it that because it's more complex, maybe people do it and they don't do it correctly or they don't really, and maybe they think, oh, well, they, they advocate like four RIR, but then they're doing it with eight RIR and they don't realize it versus a routine that's just like, follow this and push as hard as you can is maybe just easier. I don't know why that that happens, you know? um so yeah. it, it is interesting but i would also just say i don't think there is necessarily like a 3dmj routine or like an rp routine and i think that's often a misconception as well it's like maybe they saw a routine that was done one time by one of the people on these teams and then like i'm doing the 3dmj routine and it's like i'm not aware of any specific like 3dmj routine I mean, i'm sure they have some examples out there and whatnot but there's not like a blanket this is the 3dmj routine um so yeah. I think personally that it, it would be better to just follow these guys and learn the concepts there. You know, they do have some differences. Like, honestly, the, the differences aren't that great in how they train. Um, but I, I would say it seems to be that there's more of an emphasis on starting at lower RERs and ramping up over a mesocycle and whatnot with RP and Revive Stronger. Um, having done that several times, I didn't personally find much of a benefit to it. So I, I prefer more of just like, okay, I'm continuing, I'm continually doing zero to two RER depending on the set. And I just kind of keep focusing on progression from there. Um, I think you, that's mostly your experience. Is that right, Abel? Yeah, 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 definitely. It's, um, I, I think that the RP stuff, you know, to to be fair with them, it's really hard to go off of people telling you anything that this or that didn't work. Like, I'm sure that like, 
I mean, I don't know if you, but like, like probably if some coach is listening to this, who has a lot of clients, like they will have come across someone who went to them and said like, yeah, so I, I followed, like I worked with Abel and I followed his stuff, but like, it really didn't work, you know? And like, I, I would have a bunch of stuff to say in my defense. Uh, in, in some cases I know, like I even thought to myself when like something didn't quite work out with a person. Sorry. I'm just going to make some light real quick. Sure. So something didn't quite work out with a person and they didn't uh, prolong their, their coaching. I was even thinking to myself like, well, okay, like, like this could be typically someone who could give a shitty review about me. Um, but, and, and then, then I would have a lot of things to say about like why things didn't work out, you know? And the, the, the same thing goes for, for anyone, including RP, obviously RP is a huge company. So they will have a lot of people who have followed their stuff and, you know, rule of big numbers. There will be a lot of people who failed at it. I'm, I'm sure there sure. will be people who say that this, like never, nothing worked this well. Um, it's, it's more complicated to make a system like that work than something that is a bit more straightforward. And you always just kind of train pretty hard and just look to progress. So I would always expect someone or a system like that to have more failure stories um, it, simply because like a, a lot of people will follow it, like a lot of experienced lifters who will be better at this to, to make something like this work. And then, you know, intermediates and beginners. Yeah. Like a lot of them will screw it up. I'm sure. Um, like, I, I don't know, like if I was to put someone under the wings of Mike Israel or Jared or whoever directly or Steve Hall, you know, I, I would be pretty confident that they will do very well. You know, I, I, I doubt that they will be just a bunch of people who like never train particularly hard and they're just like wussing around because that's often the perception that we are getting because like they start their mesocycles at like four RIR and then gradually build up to zero. I don't know if I, when I'm looking at the videos of Steve Hall and, and Mike, it seems like they're training pretty hard for the most part. So it, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure it would work. It's just um, a lot of moving variables. And I think for a lot of intermediates and novices, I think there is just uh, too long of a time, like like the period in which you're testing your performance and you're comparing apples to apples because, okay, one RIR, one RIR. Like how much did I progress? I think it's too long. For advanced lifters who will progress like super, super slowly, um, for you, for example, like you've been lifting for like what, 16, 17 years, something like that. I think for you, it, it wouldn't be a bad system to follow actually compared to just trying to progress all the time because progress is slow anyway. Yeah. Um, sometimes so slow that like, you're not sure that if you're even progressing. Right. So I think it, it, it would be actually totally fine probably to follow something like this. I think intermediates and novices should follow something a bit more aggressive as a progression scheme. That's my opinion. That yeah <laughs> yeah no, no and it's a, it's a concept i brought up on i was on um jordan lips podcast recently and he i mentioned how you and i have discussed how it is some of the are some of these things that we're doing just kind of masking the fact that progression is not happening for a long time and in the same way that i said about leg day earlier i was like you know you could make the argument that well if you're really not progressing much anyway why are you torturing yourself with these leg sessions now the counter argument to that would be well maybe you need to torture yourself to get any progress and you won't know unless you do it so that's fine um but you could make a similar argument with this whole failure thing if you're like well and I, i've thought this myself i'm like well if we believe that three rar is just as effective as two and one and zero rar and zero rar is way more painful and those last few reps really suck you could make like you, you could certainly make the argument and i'm not making this argument but you could make the argument why not just always train at three to four RAR if it's going to be the same results and you're not going to have so much suck <laughs> in your training um, or even just like the revive stronger and Renaissance periodization method of, Hey, if you can have one out of every four workouts be a zero RAR rather than every workout, why not? Like you're getting to do easier training. That should be just as fun, if not more fun, because you're not in so much pain why not do it? Now I say that, and then I don't, I don't follow that. Right. I always do train <laughs> the failure pretty much every session, but uh, you could make the argument. Yeah. Yeah. If I can just comment on that, like it's, it, and I, and I think honestly, that's why nobody recommends training with three to four RIR all the time. And 
I, I remember your last interview with Eric, um, Eric Helms, where, where I said that it was maybe the best Eric Helms interview I've heard. And it's true, but that one part annoyed me a little bit that he just wasn't willing to answer you straight. Like, so like, do you say, do you think I would be fine training with like five to six or I or my entire training career? It's like, well, but you need to train close to failure sometimes to know what failure is and stuff like that. It's like, no, fuck, like just answer the question. Do you think it would be fine or not? And, but, but I think honestly, that's, that's his reason. And that, that's Mike's reason. That's what most people's reasons are, is that like, you just don't like, we don't know for sure if it's really as good to train with like four to six RIR or something as with like one to zero RIR. So like, wh what are you going to put your money on? Like, if you're not sure, like just do what seemingly always worked for like a lot of lifters what's also intuitive, like if training grows muscle, harder training grows more muscle, right? So at least like some of your training should be pretty damn hard. And you can also incorporate some easier sets, but still pretty hard sets. And yeah, like probably is going to work fairly well. So I think it's just a, you know, insurance policy of sorts, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we'll wrap up on that one. I have one more I wanted to get to on um, AM and PM sessions, but we'll leave that as a teaser for the next one because I have a client waiting on me. So uh, yeah. always fun, Abel. We'll do we'll break this up. So if you're watching this, then part one was on my channel. So come check it out. And uh, where can well, I would say where can we find you, Abel? But this the part's going to be on your channel, so you here. can find him right here. Keep watching <laughs> this channel. <laughs> where can we find you? Uh, so I'm sure we'll have a link below brains and gains podcast, brains and podcast.com and Instagram, Dave underscore McConey. And if you guys have other questions, you can either post them in the comment section, uh, DM us. Your Instagram is still working tentatively, right? So you yeah. can DM either one of us. Yep. Sounds good. Well, cool.